You thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your will. And if you had not loved me first, I would refuse you still But as I ran, but as I ran My hell-bound race Indifferent to the cost You looked upon my helpless state And led me to the cross and I beheld God's love display You suffered in my place You bore the wrath reserved for me Now all I know is grace Hallelujah, hallelujah to this crazy world that we live in. Help us to worship you, to see you tonight, to behold you, to through these songs gaze upon your glory, Jesus, and worship you with everything that we are because you are worthy. You shed your blood for us, Lord. You are so worthy. We thank you, Jesus. We worship you. Not just singing songs, but from our hearts, our hearts as we reflect on the gospel reality, it just causes us to rejoice that we're free and forgiven, that we're loved and welcomed. To the cross I look, to the cross I claim, and of its suffering I do drain. Of its work I do sing For on it my Savior Both bruised and crushed 
show that God is love. Amen. God is just. And at the cross, you, you beckon me. You draw me gently to my knees, and I am lost for words. So. Lost in love, I'm sweetly broken, wholly surrendered. You may take a seat if you like or stand. What a priceless gift, undeserved life. Have I been? Christ crucified Hallelujah. You call me out of death You call me into life And I was under your wrath Now through the cross I'm reconciled Cross you beckon me, you draw me gently to my knees, and I am lost for words, so lost in love. I'm sweetly broken, holy surrender in all the cross in all of the cross. Wondrous your redeeming love, how great is your faithfulness, and how great is your faithfulness, Let's sing that again, and how great is your faithfulness, and at the cross you, you beckon me. Draw me gently to my knees and I am lost for words so lost in love I'm sweetly broken holy surrender we are here by your sacrifice in the life that you gave we are healed for you paid the price and by your grace we are saved we are saved Let's sing that again and just take it in. We are healed by your sacrifice in the life that you gave. We are healed for you paid the price. And by your grace we are saved. We are saved. Who is this King of glory that pursues me with his love? me with each hearing of his softly spoken word my conscience a reminder 
of forgiveness that I need. Who is this King of glory who offers it to me? Who is this King of angels, a blessed Prince of peace? Revealing things of heaven and all its mysteries. My spirit's ever longing for his grace in which to stand. Who is this King of glory, the Son of God and Son of His name is Jesus, precious Jesus, the Lord Almighty, the King of my heart, the King of glory. Who is this King of glory? Who is this King of glory? With strength and majesty And wisdom beyond measure The gracious King of kings The Lord of earth and heaven The creator of all things He is this King of glory, He's everything to me. His name is Jesus, precious Jesus, the Lord Almighty, the King of my heart, the King of glory. Lord of earth and heaven, the Lord of earth and heaven, the creator of all things, he is the king of glory, he's everything to me. King of glory. His name is Jesus, precious Jesus, the Lord Almighty, the King of my heart, the King of glory. Jesus, the Lord Almighty, the King of my heart, the King of glory. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. For my soul longs and even faints for you. 
For here my heart is satisfied Within your presence I sing beneath the shadow of your wings Let's sing that Cause better is one day in your courts Better is one day in your house Better is one day in your courts Thousands elsewhere Better is one day in your courts Better is one day in your house Better is one day in your courts Thousands elsewhere And a thousands elsewhere that's our heart tonight. 
You are our all in all. The very breath we take. And as we just sang to the better than one day in your courts than anything else in life. Better than one word from you. One sense of peace and touch can change our trial for a long, long time. And so, Lord, we just ask that you would intervene in our life tonight and you would speak to us clearly through truth. We ask that you would help us see you with the eye of faith tonight and sense your presence. That's why we're here. We want to know you better. We want to follow you harder. We want you to convict us where conviction is necessary and cleansing is appropriate. So Lord, we're yours tonight. Speak to us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And although I don't need logs on the fire, I probably should do it anyway. Yeah? Well, good evening, folks. We are in 2 Samuel chapter 16 and 17 this evening. We'll be picking up in chapter 16 where Pastor Kelly left off, verse 15, and then we'll get in also chapter 17. What has the Lord done in your life, in your most recent past, to lift you out of your lowest moments? Think about it. That's where we're going tonight. God's involvement in our, our life at our lowest moments. Lowest. Happens all the time. You know, if, we're, if we look hard enough, it happens all the time. It wasn't long ago that there were some ex, external circumstances in my life and, and in Jenny's life that were very stressful. And... Uh, confusing and I came to church Jenny and I were here sitting in church on Sunday and Rick said something in a sermon about not focusing on your immediate circumstances but look to what the Lord's doing in your life and folks I came in stressed and I felt like warm water just washed over me no more worry, no more stress. Gone. Gone. And so he does that all the time. You've probably been a recipient of being really feeling lonely or sad or broken. And out of no, no one else knows it but you and the Lord. And out of nowhere, you get a phone call. Exactly what you needed at that very moment. This happens all the time. Now, as we're going to see in the life of David tonight, again, this man, King David, is at another rock bottom, low moment in his life. And we'll see the Lord three, four, five times lift him right out of his despair. Sometimes he does that and the circumstances don't change at all. It's like he changes us in the circumstances. You know what I mean? He doesn't take the trial. He just gives us a new perspective and a new heart through the trial. And that's what he does with David tonight. Um, this is getting pretty colorful, the second Samuel. I don't know if you've noticed that. One of the commentators I was reading today in study said... You know, this particular chapter feels like a James Bond movie. I mean, there's excitement here. 
There's drama, action, activity, really good. Most of all, the Lord shows up in it all. By way of a little bit of background, we know that Absalom killed his brother a couple years prior to this. And David, King David, the father of Absalom and his brother, was so grief-stricken that he, Absalom knew he would be, and so he left the area, moved out of the area. And in a sense, that was good because he was banished from his father's home, house, palace anyway. Well, after time, um, Absalom sends word to David and, and wants to know if he could come and see him. So it might have been a couple of years. And Absalom shows up, chapter 13, 14. And David embraced him and kissed him. Matter of fact, look there. Look at the end of chapter 14. This is David's, verse 33, chapter 14, verse 33. This is David's commander of the army. Then Joab went to the king and told him, and he summoned Absalom. So he came to the king and bowed himself on his face to the ground before the king, and the king kissed Absalom. And look at verse 1, like the very next verse of chapter 15. After this, Absalom got himself a chariot and horses and 50 men to run before him. And Absalom used to rise early and stand beside the way of the gate. The gates of the city were meeting places. They made judicial decisions and a lot of elders would gather there and a lot of people would bring their problems there to talk to the elders right at the entrance of a city, the city gates. And when any man had a dispute to come before the king for judgment, Absalom would call to him and say, from what city are you? And when he said, your servant is of such and such a tribe in Israel, Absalom would say to him, see, your claims are good and right, but there is no man, i.e., designated by the king or the king to hear you. Like there's no one here to help you, but I'm here. Then Absalom would say, Oh, that I would judge, be the judge in the land. Then every man with a dispute or cause might come to me, and I would give him justice. And it goes on that he stole, the key verse is that Absalom stole the hearts of the king's people. So he's no sooner back in his father's graces and he's starting to conspire to dethrone his father. That's what he's doing. And so the story kind of goes on. Pastor Kelly left off in chapter 16. And we're going to see that he not only is crushed, as any father would be, at his son's behavior. It's like it's one thing to have a son and not see him and not have contact with him for a long time. But it's another thing for that very son to stand against you as a father and take down everything that's precious to you as his father through deceit, manipulation. But not only that, David's counselor, uh, I'm going to have to, I'll probably be able to say it by the end of the evening because I'm going to say it about 40 times, Ahithophel was David's counselor when David was the king and very, very close confidant. And so as Absalom tried to conspire, set up this conspiracy and dethrone, have a 
a mutiny in Israel towards his father and endeared himself to them in lieu of his father. His confidant and counselor also went with Absalom and left David as well. So he lost his closest spiritual guide, if you will, and his son. It was a double loss. Not over something that he had done wrong, but it was over the evil intent of their hearts to do this to David. Like he didn't even cause this. It just happened. So very, very difficult. When a close friend of yours and mine, or God forbid, a family member, turn their back on us. Many times, no explanation. Or if it, there is an explanation, it's predicated on mistruths and misunderstandings. And you go like, are you kidding me? And there's no way back. There's just no way back. This type of betrayal is unbelievably painful. Obviously, we can take into divorce too, you know, that kind, that kind of violation, which has happened to me in my life. So Absalom stole the heart of the people from David. Turn to chapter 15 real quick, 2 Samuel chapter 15, because this is a snapshot of David's lowest moment. He's been given the word that his son is raising up men of might to dethrone him, to come into Jerusalem, and to ransack all of the people there, David and his people. So David says to all of them, we, we need to leave. We need to leave our palace. We need to leave our home. We need to leave everything that means something to us. And if you turn to verse 32, we read, so they're preparing to leave. They're leaving Jerusalem. While David was coming to the summit, that's the summit of the Mount of Olives. We know someone else that was betrayed there too. Our Lord Jesus. Where God was worshipped, behold, Hushai the Archite, one of David's closest, most loyal friends still, came to meet him with his coat torn and dirt on his head. I'll get back to that. Jump up to verse 30. But as David went up the ascent of the Mount of Olives, so he's climbing up a slope, preparing to leave, they're going to go across the Jordan River. Weeping as he went. I mean, now think of this man. He's the apple of God's own eye. He's the king of Israel. God has appointed him. He's the Lord Jesus' forerunner, so to speak. Jesus becomes the greater king, but he comes from David's seed. Very significant. He's climbing the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went, barefoot, with his head covered. That was a sign of the deepest grief and mourning. This is a king. And all the people who were with him covered their heads. They did what the king did. And they went up weeping as they went. And it was told David, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. That's like 
the worst thing they could have said. And David said, O Lord, please turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. While David was coming to the summit where God was worshipped, behold, Hushai, a friend, came to meet him with his coat torn and dirt on his head. David, at his lowest moment, is leaving his palace and his home. And while he's leaving, they say, oh, by the way, not only your son has conspired, but your best friend has well. And then we read that one of his friends shows up with his coat torn. They were probably talking together at this point. And he's weeping as well. That was like the Lord's first sign at David's lowest moment. You're not going alone through this. Do you know that the Lord hugs us through other people? Do you know that he talks to us through phone calls and cell phones and words of encouragement through other people? Other people. David has lost those that are closest to him. Yet this one man, who was a friend of David as well, and will continue to be, as you'll see, shows up and he weeps and he tears his clothes too. He knew, now that's a friend. That's a friend. If there's anyone in our life who comes alongside us in our deepest grief and in our deepest loss, and they just cry with us or weep with us and actually say nothing. If you have one person like that in your life, you are a wealthy person. So God shows David right away as he's almost literally crawling up this mountain. No shoes, no family, weeping. There's just a little sidebar, but it's very, very important. For those of us who have people in our life right now, maybe you are right where I'm talking about at your lowest moment or close to it. But God calls us to love people that are in their lowest moments frequently. So there's a story of a man named Joe Bailey. He lost three children, if you can imagine that. He had three children. They were all killed at separate times. He wrote a book called The View from the Hearse, if you can imagine that, on grief and death. Listen to this phrase, he says. I was sitting torn by grief. Someone came and talked to me of God's dealings, of why it happened, of hope beyond the grave. He talked constantly. He said things I already knew were true. I was unmoved except I wish he would just go away. He finally did. Another man came and sat beside me. He didn't talk. He didn't ask me leading questions. He just sat beside me for an hour and more, listened when I said something, answered briefly, prayed simply, and left. I was moved. I was comforted. I hated to see him go. This was a friend. So at David's lowest moment, 
God sent him a friend like that. And he wept, wept with David. Verse 15, chapter 16, we read that Absalom entered Jerusalem and so did David's ex best friend and counselor. They went into an abandoned city. David and his people are gone. By the way, as I was thinking about this, just the imagery of what it must have looked like, David and his people left the city. I mean, they evacuated the city. Absalom and his people came in. Nobody tried to stop them. No one said a word the few that were probably left there. And I got a picture in my mind of The Fiddler on the Roof. You ever see the movie The Fiddler on the Roof? Great movie. Got to see it. About the Russians coming into this little village in Russia. And there was a Russian Jewish community there. I, I, I think of the music, I think of Tevia, the father, who was, talked to God all the time. He was hilarious. He had some of the best theology I've heard yet. Watch the movie. You'll love it. And uh, this Russian soldier came in and said, you have three days. It was a winter month, and he said, you have three days to evacuate your home. I don't know where they sent them. You know, does anybody know where they sent them? Maybe further, maybe, maybe Siberia, or something. And so the picture is they have these old carts with big wooden wheels with sheep and pigeons and goats and donkeys and little children confused. Mommy, Daddy, why are we leaving our home? And, and then they have this, you know, very somber Jewish music in the background. And there they go. That was David and his people. And while they're leaving, here comes Absalom with his entourage, feeling pretty good about himself. Verse 16. And when Hushai, the archite, David's friend, it's David's friend. It was another counselor that David had. came to Absalom, he said, long live the king, long live the king. Now, I just want to go back. If you'll go back. Okay, I didn't mark it down, so I don't have it off the top of my head. But what had happened is while David was leaving the city, a couple of priests came with the Ark of the Covenant, and they were going to leave too. And David said, no, take it back to Jerusalem. And you can be my eyes and my ears, my informants. Tell me what's going on there when Absalom sets up his throne. But also his friend Hushai came to him. And he said, no, no, I want you to go back too. Because if you go back, Absalom knows that you're my friend and my counselor. And if you go back and let him know that you now, like the other confidant, are going to stand with him. That's a very, very good thing. You also can be my eyes and my ears. And change maybe Absalom's thinking to a degree. So that's what Hushai did. He went back. He's an informant. David has three informants. Actually, he has more than that, but... Verse 16, now when Hushai, the archite, David's friend, came to Absalom, Hushai said to Absalom, long live the king, long live the king. Now, that's a pretty smart thing to say to someone who thinks he's a king. Although we see through here a play on words. I think Absalom means David. I mean, uh, Hushai meant David. David, long live my king. But he didn't say that. He said, long live the king. Got Absalom's attention. And Absalom said to Hushai, he's pretty skeptical, of course. 
He knows that this is his father's friend and counselor as well. And Absalom said to Hushai, Is this your loyalty to your friend, my father? Why do you not go with your friend, my father? And Hushai said to Absalom, No. For whom the Lord and this people and all the men of Israel have chosen. Now that was music to Absalom's ears. Everybody in Israel knew that God chose David after King Saul. But Absalom was so self-deceived and so arrogant and so angry with his father. He just got the thought that I can win over people, and he did. And I'm the rightful king now. It wasn't that uncommon in those days for the son to be heir of the throne, after all. And so he came back. And Hushai knew how to appeal to him. He knew exactly what to say. He said, I will be with you, and I will remain with you. Whom else should I serve, verse 19? Should it not be David's son? I have served your father, and I will serve you as well. So Absalom takes the bait, and he now trusts Hushai. So David has in his informant planted. David was very, very keen, very wise. Then Absalom said to Ahithophel, that's the other counselor, that's now Absalom's counselor. Absalom said to Ahithophel, give your counsel. What should we do? You're my counselor now. You left my father, now you're mine. So I have the situation. I've been given this advice from David's friend who says he's now loyal to me. What do you think? Verse 21, Ahithophel said to Absalom, go into your father's concubines. David had a harem. Can't explain a lot about it. He just did. And considered them, believe it or not, in some ways as his wives. They were dear to him. Go into your father's concubines whom he has left to keep the house. Because when David vacated the city, he left ten concubines to watch property. And all Israel will hear that you have made yourself a stench to your father, and the hands of all who are with you will be strengthened. In other words, when you publicly, and this is what they did, they set up tents on the palace roof, which I might add, was the exact same spot where David first lusted after Bathsheba and had her brought to him. Yikes. They set up tents. Well, let me read on, actually. Um, verse 22. So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the roof, and Absalom went into his father's concubines in the sight of all of Israel. Now in those days, the counsel of Ahithophel gave was as if one was consulting with the word of God. So was all the counsel of Ahithophel esteemed by David and Absalom. And like the writer is going, this is unbelievable. Here was a man that when he spoke to David and gave him counsel, it was as if he was talking God's very words. I mean, he's shocked. Now this man gives vile counsel like this. 
Hold your finger there. We'll come right back. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 12. Now, David, of course, in chapter 12, as I just said, was walking on the palace roof one spring afternoon. It actually says in chapter 12, verse 1, that when the kings go out to war, they went out every spring, apparently, David stayed back. You ever hear the phrase, idleship, uh, uh, idleness is the devil's workshop? It's true. And so David's walking on roof. He says, sees Bathsheba bathing and has her brought to him, has sex with her, she conceives. If that wasn't enough, when her husband, Uriah, came off the battlefield, he was so loyal to David, he didn't even want to go home. He wanted to just lay outside the David's, David's uh, door to his palace. And David said, no, you need to go home and be with your wife. It's like, uh, we got to cover this up real quick, real quick. And he wouldn't do it. So when they went out on battlefield again, he told his commander to send Uriah out on the front line where the fighting was the worst and David got his wish, he was killed and his the woman that he slept with, Bathsheba was pregnant with child goes through nine months of pregnancy has a little son all of this is secretive all of it. Nobody's really known that David did this. Um, they probably thought after the husband had died that he just took Bathsheba and they became husband and wife. Who knows? But it was all done in the dark. It was done in the secret. There was only one problem. Like the biggest problem. God saw everything. And so nine months to a year goes by, the baby's there, and Nathan the prophet pays David a visit. And he tells him a powerful story. I mean, it's just, just the story itself. Read chapter 12 sometime. And he confronted David and said, you're the man that has done this. Okay, look at, look at chapter, verse 10 and 12 in chapter 12. This is, this is what Nathan told David would, ha would happen to him because of this. Verse 10 and 12. Now therefore, chapter 12, 10 and 12. Now therefore, the sword, David, will never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. I mean, he wasn't even confronting David about the immorality. I mean, that was certainly a grief. He was confronting covetousness. You stole another man's wife. Serious. And because you did that, Verse 11, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. We are reading about that tonight. And it happens a few times, actually. His own son is trying to dethrone him and kill him in cold blood. I will raise up evil against you out of your own house, and I will take your wives. Here it is. This is what we're reading tonight. I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing all before Israel and before the son. And David said, I've sinned against the Lord, and that was a saving grace. 
Because the Lord said, I'm not going to hold anything against you about this, David, but you will have consequences for this the rest of your life. The sword will never leave your house. The thing that's amazing to me about this, I said this before as we were talking about other chapters, and I see it again tonight. David took it. He took the consequences of his unfaithfulness, of his lies, of his murderous act. He took it. God forgave him. You do not see David anywhere with self-pity, with crying about his lot in life. You see David say, I've deserved everything that I've gotten. And he continued to write psalms and worship. Amazing. Let's go back to 16 now. So the very thing that they said would happen is happening right now. In chapter 16. And that's what happened. Verse 23. Now in those days the council of Ant- Hithapel gave, as I said, was like David was listening to God's word. Chapter 17, verse 1. Moreover, so his first piece of counsel, and he's always been right on before, but his first piece of counsel was about as dark, sensual, and vicious a vice anyone could give. By the way, he says, it, when this does this, David's going to become such a stench. You're going to become such a stench, Absalom, by doing this on David's roof with his wives, so to speak. Don't get caught on that. It's just it's the point. David will not let that one go. That kind of violation? And so um, this will cause a civil war. You must know that this will cause a civil war, and it almost did. So in that way, Absalom's men of might were strengthened against David even more now. The bridge is built for sure or the bridge is down for sure, and they are divided now. Now, this counselor has some more advice, if you can believe this. By the way, pretty basic, Christianity 101, if we need counseling, find someone that loves you and has your back, and someone that will never give you advice contrary to God's word. If you find that, that's the person you want to talk to. You don't want to talk to your friends at a pub that side with you if you're going to leave your wife. You want to find someone that knows God's word and loves you and is protective of you. Psalms 1 says it right. Psalm says, do not seek the counsel of the ungodly. Do not go after that kind of wisdom. And by the way, let me add to this. I'm talking about the wisdom and the advice of our culture. Totally contrary to our faith in the scriptures. In many ways. In many ways. But don't listen to your friends. If they don't love Christ, although God, if God can talk through a donkey, he can talk through anybody. I mean, he did, did do that in the Old Testament. Sometimes he talks to us through people that don't love the Lord, and it's coincidental. But I'm just saying, you read this story, watch out who's giving you advice. Be careful. So here he goes again. Verse 1, moreover, Ahithophel said to Absalom, Let me choose 12,000 men, and I will arise and pursue David tonight. 
I will come upon him while he's weary and discouraged and throw him into a panic. And all the people who are with him will flee. And I will strike down only the king. And I will bring all the people back to you as a bride comes home to her husband. You seek the life of only one man and all of the people will be at peace. And the advice seem right in the eyes of Absalom and all of the elders of Israel who were just as deceived. The first word that came to mind was whacked, but deceived is probably more appropriate. Um, what he's doing is he's saying, let's, here, here's some rules of war. Surprise attack. So we know that they're tired, they're weary, and they're broken down and discouraged because their city's been taken over. They have a lot of miles to walk. They're broken as families. And by the way, uh, culturally or historically, they wouldn't attack armies in, at night. This was very unusual. So let's get a big force. That's military rule number one. Have as many fighters as you can. Rule number two, surprise attack. They're down. Kick them while they're down. And then the other rule was we only need one life. We don't have to hurt anybody else. That sounded like pretty good advice to Absalom. Pretty good advice. So there's stroke of genius just for a moment for Absalom here. Verse 5. Then Absalom said, Call Hushai, the archite, also, and let us hear what he has to say. It's called a second opinion. We trust him now. We believe he's left David's throne room and come to mine. He's smart really smart. Let's see what he has to say. Let's second opinion. And when Hushai came to Absalom, Absalom said to him, thus has Ahithophel spoken. Shall we do as he says? If not, you speak. Then Hushai said to Absalom, uh, this time his counsel's not good. Not good. By the way, if you have family and friends and they're venting to you and they're going to a counselor or they're talking to one of their friends or they're, you know, venting on Facebook and they ask you for your input and the advice was bad, best friends in the world say that advice was bad. That's like a really good friend. Worst friends say, oh, maybe it will work for you. No, best friends, that's bad advice. Yeah? Don't tell me what I want to hear. Tell me what I need to hear. And so he said that. His advice wasn't good this time. Then Hushai said, this is his advice now. You know that your father and his men are mighty men and that they are enraged like a bear robbed of her cubs in the fields. Now it's very interesting, the wisdom of the two for different men. Ahithashel said they're going to be weak, confused, exhausted. Let's get them while they're down. And he says, oh no. You know your father. If anybody knows your father, it's you. He's the mightiest warrior Israel's ever had. And so are his men. If you try this plot, the word's going to get out that Absalom's been slaughtered and everybody's heart will melt in fear. That's what he says. Let's go on. 
Verse 9, behold, now, David's hiding now. That's the other thing. They said, let's attack him at night. He goes, you know your father? He's a soldier. He's a commander. He doesn't stay with his troops at night. He hides. He's starting to reason with them, and, and his son's going, oh, that is like my father, actually. Behold, even now he's hidden himself in one of the pits or some other place. As soon as some of the people fall, that is Absalom's people, at the first attack, whoever hears it will say there's been a slaughter among the people who follow Absalom. Then even the valiant man whose heart is like the heart of a lion will utterly melt with fear. For all Israel knows that your father is a mighty man and that those who are with him are valiant men. But my counsel is that all of Israel be gathered to you from Dan to Beersheba, that's a lot of miles, as the sand of the sea for the multitude that you may go to battle in person. Here's his wisdom. Don't rush off quickly with only 12,000 men on a surprise attack. In other words, you're too rash. That's not methodical. Think about this. Absalom, give it some thought. Don't rush too quickly. Wait, get a plan and a strategy. So he said, I think you should not just grab 1,200 men. I think you should go to every tribe in all of the land of Israel and get thousands of them, like the sand of the sea, and not only take David out, but take his whole kingdom out. Well, the wisdom in that was that that would buy David time. It's going to buy David time now. He can get situated. He ends up going to a fortress. It is protected completely for any kind of onslaught. Prior to this, they were on the shores of the Dead Sea. It's all open. And so, stroke of genius. Do this. So, so he, had the, he was in a hard situation because he's going to purposely deceive, but he has to make it sound like it's a good idea for Absalom's benefit and at the same time have David protected in the process and ultimately the victor. You ever have to make decisions like that? Sometimes I do. I go, oh my gosh. Like, right or left. This is a tough one. Many times, God calls us to make decisions that at a, in a moment in time, in time, feels like a lose-lose proposition. Like lose-lose. But it's usually win-lose, it, but it might come later. Um... Okay, where am I? What verse am I now? 12, thank you. We're going to just read for a little bit here. So, we shall come upon him in some place where he's to be found, and we shall light upon him like the dew falls on the ground. In other words, this will be so easy. You know when dew falls on grass? It's like so light, you can't visibly see it when it happens. It's so natural. If you do take my advice... Taking David and his army down will be so easy. We could do this easily. No lives lost except David's army. Verse 13. If he withdraws into a city, then all Israel will bring ropes to that city, and we shall drag it into the valley until not even a pebble is to be found there. And Absalom and all the men of Israel said, the counsel of Hushai the archite is better than the counsel of Ahithophel, for the Lord has a day. Now here's something very important. This last sentence of verse 14 is the author's footnote. This is the author's footnote about what's going on. This is what the author says right at this point. He sees God's hand all over the situation and in control of everything that's happened. At David's lowest point, God is in control. 
So let's see what the author says about this. For the Lord had ordained to defeat the good counsel of Ahithophel so that the Lord might bring harm upon Absalom and just turn everything around. And he does. Little sidebar there. You know the word, it's a, it's a good biblical word. You will only see it in the Old Testament, a lot in Psalms. David authored most of Psalms. The word is vindication. The word simply means that when injustice is against you and me, or we're being misrepresented, or lied to, or ripped off, or cheated, or abandoned, God makes that up. He turns everything on its head and protects you. After all of this, all of the scheme and all of the deceit, David not only has a hair touched on his head, he takes all of his people and they march right back to Jerusalem where they started because the Lord was in control. The word is vindication. That's one of the incredible assurances of faith that we have as Christian. It may look dark and bleak now. It may look like everything is against you. God's not done yet. He's not done. Verse 15. Then Hushai said to Zadok and Abathar the priests, Thus, and so did Athabel's counsel and Absalom and the elders of Israel, and thus, and so I have counseled. Now, therefore, here's a plan that he has. Okay? Now, how do, what do we do next? They're in Jerusalem. David's life and his army's in danger. So this is their plan. This is where I think it's like a Bond movie, you know, kind of. Now, therefore, send quickly and tell David, do not stay at the, tonight at the fords of the wilderness near the Dead Sea. That's where they were going to stay. But by all means, pass over, lest the king and all the people who are with him be swallowed up. You're in a dangerous place, David. You need to move. Now, Jonathan and Ahimez, who were sons of the priest, that David sent back to Jerusalem, they were also informants. A female servant was to go and tell them, and they were to go and tell King David, for they were not to be seen entering the city. So, this is the plan. The priest's sons are standing outside of the city in the Kidron Valley, probably maybe just stones throw outside the city walls waiting for their next cue. A female servant, unnamed, is sent with like a code, a message, to tell them of the change of plans. There's going to be a change. Unnamed woman, don't forget that, But a young man saw them and told Absalom. So he saw these two men just hanging around outside the city, waiting for their next word as to what to do. But another young man saw them and told Absalom. So both of them went away quickly and came to the house of a man at Behurim, which David was very familiar with, who had a well in his courtyard. And they went down into it, and the woman took, this is the man's wife now. So the wife had these two men come in. He, they knew that they were followers of David. They knew they were in trouble. So they hid them inside of a well. And the wife took and spread a covering over the well's mouth and scattered grain on it, and nothing was known of it. In other words, you look at it and you go, I don't see anything. I don't see anybody, you know. 
When Absalom's servants came to the woman at the house, they said, Where are Ahimaaz and Jonathan? And the woman said to them, They have gone over the brook of water. And when they had sought and could not find them, they returned to Jerusalem. After they had gone, the men came up out of the well and went and told King David. They said to David, Arise and go quickly over the water, for thus and so has Ahithophel counseled against you. Then David arose and all the people who were with him, and they crossed the Jordan. By daybreak, not one was left who had not crossed the Jordan. So they got out of there. They're safe now. When Ahithophel saw that the counsel, his counsel was not followed, he saddled his donkey, went off home to his own city. He set his house in order and hanged himself. Because he knew that he was going to be killed anyway. So. And they gave him a decent burial. Just a little side note that I read about him. Up until this one time, he was a godly man. He was King David's counselor. He went dark. But they still gave him a, a, a nice burial and funeral because his life spoke better of him than that event. I preached a couple Sundays ago and I talked about uh, Thomas doubting the Lord and Peter denying him. And the Lord went after him as a resurrected Savior. He went after them. And he restored both of them. And I said, how many people, how many of us, if we've had a sordid past or we have failed the Lord, we, we assess the value of who we are with a single event. God doesn't see us that way. He forgives us. He loves us. He refuses to have us live in shame. That's why he went to the cross. And so I guess we can say a little bit about that with this guy, even though he went dark and who knows where he is now, but the bulk of his life was godly. Verse 24, last section. Then David came to Mahanim. So Mahanim was a fortress. He had time to find a safe place to go. He's not vulnerable anymore. And now they're ready to fight. Should Absalom bring his men? His counselor's dead now. David is set. God has protected him. He's protected him from a friend that mourned with him. He's protected from a friend that risked his life to go into the city and deceive Absalom. He's been protected by two men who would stand outside the city walls, which was incredibly dangerous if they were noticed. As you could see, they went looking for him. He was protected by an unnamed woman who risked her life to carry a message, a note, a code to these men. He was protected from a farmer and his wife who let him hide in the well and covered it over with grain. And all along through this, when David's at his lowest, when he's weeping, when he's betrayed by those closest, God sends people to him. And he will do the same for you and I. You must believe this. Sometimes he runs a little late, in my opinion, We cannot separate our life and our situation from the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you may not think he's close to you. He's as closer than, close as your next breath. The rest of our eternity. Look at this last portion. As if he wasn't protected and lifted out of his low point enough, here's more at the end. 
So David came to Mahanim, it's a fortress now, and Absalom crossed the Jordan with all the men of Israel. Absalom set a, another relative over the army instead of Joab, so on and so forth. Look at verse 27. So David came to Mahanim, Shobi, the son of Nahash, from Rabbah, of the Ammonites, and Macher, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar, and Brasilia, the Gileite, from Roj. I know you're going to remember all of this. Look at what they brought David. These, by the way, were not necessarily friends of Israel, necessarily. I mean, they weren't Israelis, but there was a relationship of some sort. They saw David and the situation he was in. Look where they brought him. They brought beds. Now, when they ran out of Jerusalem, they didn't carry their beds. They slept on dirt. Bas and there's a lot of dirt there. Basins. What, how did they wash? Basins. Earthen vessels, wheat, barley, flour, parched grain, beans and lentils, honey and curds, and sheep and cheese from the herd for David and the people with him to eat. For they said, the people are hungry and weary, and thirsty in the wilderness. Now, we have five sightings when he is at his lowest where the Lord provided through other people. You are not alone in your trial tonight, please. You are not alone. And the Lord's not done with you yet. He still has a purpose and plan that no one can thwart no one, you know what? No one can, not, no human being can mess with God's plan for your life. If that were true, we're assigning them more power and persuasion than the Lord. No one can mess with our life, ultimately, unless God allows it, but then it's for a higher purpose. Eh? I close with this. God in his wisdom and sovereignty controls the course and events of our life. Do you believe this? To the degree that you truly believe that will be to the degree that you have a sense of peace and well-being. I mean, it doesn't mean that we can't get scared. It doesn't mean that we can't fall on our face and cry. It doesn't mean that we can't hate moments in life or get angry. But overall, God in his wisdom and sovereignty controls the events and course of our life. All things, like not some things, all things work together for good to them that love God. Amen? Secondly, when life gets confusing, seek godly counsel. I've already said that. Be careful who you listen to, please. God never talks out of both sides of his mouth. If you get information that feels uncomfortable and you can't find it in Scripture or a biblical principle, don't take it. Don't take it. Three, God ministers to us through other caring people, some that we least expect. Like these people were unnamed, some of them. And God used them to protect and minister to David. Lastly, David was at his lowest moment when he ascended the Mount of Olives. Our Lord Jesus was at his lowest moment in the Garden of Gethsemane, which is at the base of the Mount of Olives. It's the olive grove of the Mount of Olives. And he was so distressed that he said, Lord, if there's any way you could take this cup of suffering, please. But in the next breath... Not my will, but thine be done. So, don't know where you're at tonight. I just know that he is faithful. If there's been unjust treatment in your life, he will vindicate you. Most of the times, it's on this side of heaven. It may not be till after you see him face to face. 
He's the ultimate judge. He knows what you're about and what's happened to you. Lord, tonight, we thank you that your, your, your word, it's not a common book. It's not a comic book. It's not a fable. They're not just poems or legends. These are historical, provable places and situations. This is how you've worked with your people. This is your plan and purpose for this world. This is how we're forgiven of our sins through the blood of Christ and we have eternal life through his empty tomb. These aren't just stories. So I pray, Lord, that you would just sink in the truths of these passages tonight. So glad that we see a man who was really down and every step of the way there was some one to minister to him. We thank you. I pray for anyone here tonight that is at that point and is wondering what you're doing and where you're at in their life right now. Lord, would you show them that you're with them? In Jesus' name, amen.